Listening fill in the blanks. Let's start. The painting is set late at night in a 19th century Parisian nightclub. A barmaid stands alone behind her bar, fitted out in a black bodice that has a frilly white neckline, and with a spray of flowers sitting across her decolletage. She rests her hands on the bar and gazes out forlornly at a point just below the viewer, not quite making eye contact. Also on the bar are some bottles of liquor and a bowl of oranges, but much of the activity in the room takes place in the reflection of a mirror behind the barmaid. Through this mirror, we see an auditorium, bustling with blurred figures and faces, men in top hats, a woman examining the scene below her through binoculars, another in long gloves, even the feet of a trapeze artist demonstrating acrobatic feats above his adoring crowd. In the foreground of the reflection, a man with a thick mustache is talking with the barmaid. Not everyone was supportive of Davis' change of tune compared to the recordings of his early career, universally applauded as linchpins of the jazz uber. Trumpeter Winston Marsalis derided his fusion work as being not true jazz, and pianist Bill Evans denounced the corrupting influence of record companies, noting that rock and pop draw wider audiences. In the face of this criticism Davis remained defiant, commenting that his earlier recordings were part of a moment in time that he had no feel for any more. He firmly believed that remaining stylistically inert would have hampered his ability to develop new ways of producing music. From this perspective, Davis' continual revamping of genre was not merely a rebellion, but an evolution, a necessary path that allowed him to release his full musical potential. In the early days of mountaineering, questions of safety, standards of practice, and environmental impact were not widely considered. The sport gained traction following the successful 1786 ascent of Mont Blanc, the highest peak in Western Europe, by two French mountaineers, Jacques Balmet and Michel Gabriel Picard. This event established the beginning of modern mountaineering, but the sole consideration over the next hundred years was the success or failure of climbers in reaching the summit and claiming the prestige of having made the first ascent. There are an estimated 10,000 different species of birds in the world, making them one of the most diverse groups of animals on the planet. Birds can be found in every habitat, from the tundra to the arid desert, and come in a dizzying array of shapes, sizes, and colors. For many people, birds are simply beings that exist outside their windows or that they might see on a nature hike. However, for bird watchers, these creatures are a source of never-ending fascination. Bird watching can be a relaxing hobby or a lifelong passion, and it offers a unique opportunity to connect with nature. Each time you go bird watching, you have the chance to encounter new species and learn more about the incredible world we live in. Given the environmental damage rock climbing can cause, this may be a positive outcome. It is ironic that most rock climbers and mountaineers love the outdoors and have great respect for the majesty of nature and the impressive challenges she poses, but that in the pursuit of their goals they inevitably trample sensitive vegetation, damaging and disturbing delicate flora and lichens, which grow on ledges and cliff faces. Two researchers from a Canadian university, Doug Larson and Michelle McMillan, have found that rock faces, that are regularly climbed have lost up to 80% of the coverage and diversity of native plant species. If that were not bad enough, non-native species have also been inadvertently introduced, having been carried in on climbers' boots. In any event, there can be no doubt that the era of the rock climber as a lone wolf or intrepid pioneer is over. Like many other forms of recreation, rock climbing has increasingly come under the fold of institutional efforts to curb dangerous behavior and properly manage our natural environments. This may have spoiled the magic, but it has also made the sport safer and more sustainable, and governing bodies would do well to consider heightening such efforts in the future.
time travel took a small step away from science fiction and towards science recently, when physicists discovered that subatomic particles known as neutrinos, progeny of the sun's radioactive debris, can exceed the speed of light. The unassuming particle, it is electrically neutral, small but with a non-zero mass, and able to penetrate the human form undetected, is on its way to becoming a rock star of the scientific world. Even though, we may know more about what parts of the brain are responsible for humor, it is still hard to explain why we don't laugh or giggle when we tickle ourselves. Darwin theorized within the expressions of the emotions in man and animals that there was a link between tickling and laughter because of the anticipation of pleasure. Because we cannot tickle ourselves and have caused laughter. Darwin speculated surprise from another person, touching a sensitive spot must have caused laughter. Some scientists believe that laughing caused by tickling is a built-in reflex even babies have. If we tickle ourselves in the same spot as our friend tickled us, we do not laugh as we did previously. The information sent to our spinal cord and brain should be exactly the same. Apparently, for tickling to work, the brain needs tension and surprise. When we tickle ourselves, we know exactly what will happen. There is no tension or surprise. A final hypothesis, one of unidentified provenance, reroutes itself quite efficiently around the grandfather paradox. Non-existence theory suggests exactly that, a person would quite simply never exist if they altered their ancestry in ways that obstructed their own birth. They would still exist in person upon returning to the present, but any chain reactions associated with their actions would not be registered. Their historical identity would be gone. Certainly. Any prospective time travelers may have to overcome more physical and logical hurdles than merely overtaking the speed of light. One such problem, posited by Rene Bargeval in his 1943 text Le Voyager Imprudent is the so-called grandfather paradox. Bargeval theorized that, if it were possible to go back in time, a time traveler could potentially kill his own grandfather. If this were to happen, however, the time traveler himself would not be born, which is already known to be true. In other words, there is a paradox in circumventing an already known future. Time travel is able to facilitate past actions that mean time travel itself cannot occur. Like, share, subscribe the channel and press the bell icon for further updates.